So I think I'll start for real now. And so today I wanted to talk about, let me paint this in, micro code. Come on, what was that? Let's try this again. Better. So, um, what is microcode? Um, so you, if if you're interested in computer architecture, or like current CPUs or whatever, you've probably heard the term. Um, you probably don't have like you probably have an, an a cons a, cons a mental concept of what it is. Um, you probably don't have any idea of what exactly it means and doesn't mean. And it doesn't help um, that this term is somewhat overloaded. It's used by different people to mean different things. In particular, like um, some GPUs have used the term microcode to mean just shader code that you upload to the GPU. That's not the sense in which I'm using microcode here at all. So I'm using microcode in the sense in which it is used by most, let's just say, uh, CPUs. Um, like I've looked at a fair few and um, I'm reasonably sure that what I'm telling you is like that it's reasonably representative in how it's used. Um, but this is one of those things. This is basically an implementation detail of architectures. And if you're doing your own architecture, you're absolutely free to make up whatever you want and call it microcode. No one can stop you. So like, I'm not trying to make this be like a prescriptive thing. I'm just describing the sort of things um, that you would normally see called that way by people who are like actually writing microcode or using or designing it into something or whatever. So what does it mean? Um, basic idea is that you have some instruction stream. Whoops. Right. Um, that gets translated somehow into like control signals. For the, for the actual hardware or data path or whatever. So for example, like if you have like, uh, example would be, um, like for the original 8086. And I don't actually know how that machine's microcode looked like internally. I'm just like giving you uh, something to give you the flavor of uh, how that kind of thing looks. If on the 8086 you do something like this instruction, add BX plus SI, this is a memory operand, comma, AX. So that's one of the more complicated 8086 instructions still exists in current x86. Like this is part of the stuff that's still uh, faithfully supported all the way through. Since even in current x86, we still have backwards compatibility and like these instruction set design features are still there. And what that turns into internally on the 8086 is like internally um, that maps into something like this. Like first, we have to uh, calculate calculate bx plus si. And this is just an add. Then second, we have um, like whatever map this into some value. Let's call it temp. Um, then we do temp2 
gets assigned basically memory, 16 byte access, whatever, at that address, at address temp. So we load that value from memory. Third, we need to um, add temp2. to the value in register AX. And fourth, mem16 at the address we computed earlier gets assigned the value we just computed. So that's a store. Like this turns into internally at least something like four operations on the 8086. Because the 8086 has basically just one ALU that's used for both uh, arithmetic logical unit that's used for both address computations and for regular arithmetic. So like this assignment here that adds temp2 and AX and this effective address calculation is done on the 8086 uh, by the same ALU. Um, current processors will actually like even f relatively small ones generally have the budget unless you're like talking tiny microcontrollers. But like even relatively small CPU cores these days have the budget to have separate adders and so on in their memory access unit. It's just not a big deal. By the point where you're putting 32 kilobits, uh, two kilobytes of cache into something, uh -huh. that's at least 32. So like 16 kilobyte data, 16 kilobyte instruction is about what you see for like small cores these days uh, at the low end. And like by the point, by the time you're have that kind of transistor budget it's like whatever like we don't care about counting uh individual 32-bit or 64-bit adders so we just pass that like it's not like if you put a vector unit somewhere or so on that has oh, lots of complicated instructions we might care but we're not at the point anymore where we have to share adders and like have to share as much as we can in the data path just to make it fit um it's just not a thing anymore, but it used to be in the 8086 and in processors of that era. So um, this year is basically four, uh, four internal operations at least. I believe on the 8086, these would actually, most of these would actually split into more than one operation, but this is like, just as a high concept, these are the four things that happen during that sequence, right? Um, where these are all things that are implied by this one instruction. So there's multiple things going on here. And that's also like this read, modify, write instruction is a thing that still exists in current x86 CPUs. Um, most RISC CPUs, um, or what's called RISC CPUs, is almost exclusively uh, load store architectures. Like, I, I'm not sure if there's, yeah, there's RISCs or that have support for at least atomic instructions that are read, modify, write. But the base instruction set for everything is load store. So separate load store operations, you don't have these kinds of operations generally on a typical risk, except for special stuff like atomic operations. There might be extensions that do this, but not for regular data operations. But on stuff like the 8086, you have this. And you have this kind of thing a lot, especially in um, Yeoli computers, like if you're in the 60s or even 50s, like microcode goes back uh, to a Brit, uh, Morris Wilkes, is I believe the one who coined the term. And I'm not sure if he invented the concept. It's like, it's always hard to tell with these kinds of things, but he published it and like he popularized it. And uh, it's like, this goes back to, at SAC or something, one of the very early machines, where they realized that they wanted to have these um, moderately fancy operations. Um, and they wanted to design these into a nice instruction set for their programmers. Um, and Ultimately, when you have an instruction set that has these kinds of things, and when you have a data path or like whatever facilities you have that are somewhat 
weaker than what the instruction set supports, you really have no other option, especially if you're space constrained. You have to break it down into multiple steps. And then you can either do a special case thing where basically for like every instruction or like at least group of instructions that are similar, you figure out the dedicated hardware logic to do this or you go, and this is like the origin of the thing, you go to something more structured where you say like, okay, I have basically regularly addressed thing, just basically memory, like originally just a ROM um, that tells the machine what to do for these kinds of instruction sequences and that uh, expands these things out. Like that's the origin of the thing. So you have way, way back, um, you use this for basically every instruction and like even not so way back, like this is like the era of refrigerator and room sized computers. Well, this is the era of room sized computers. And then by the era of refrigerator sized computers, we have, they're called mini computers now and like something like the deck Vax or PDP. Those are mini computers because they're so small, they fit inside your fridge. Well, the main CPU thing does. The disk drive is another fridge and like the terminal is another fridge, but like that's not going to do that. Uh, but um, so by that time, the computers were smaller and like especially deck and especially the Vax had extensive microprogramming. So they had a complicated instruction set and everything was in microcode. Um, like 8086 also, microprogrammed basically every instruction on the 8086 had like five six seven cycles it's just lots of cycles for everything um and then so especially if you were trying to do a relatively small and compact design you basically designed the smallest data path you could get away with and then tried to do everything over multiple cycles using more primitive operations that's how a lot of the uh, microprocessors, the early microprocessors especially, worked um, initially because they were like now like uh, in a mini computer like the CPU, the processor is not like a single chip like it is today. Um, in a mini computer, like a micro, the, your processor is something the size of at least a current motherboard and usually like multiple boards of densely packed logic um, with like wires going everywhere and like hand soldered sometimes. It's just um, kind of intense. These things were complicated and they were actually built out of discrete parts. You didn't have anything fit inside just a single chip. Um, and then by the 80s, this is also like when the, like by the well, late 70s or early 80s, was when it became possible to build, actually, I guess, like the first microprocessors, like the Intel 4004 were something like 75 or so, I think. Like the uh, Intel 4004 uh, is the first recognizable microprocessor. Like it's, like it's the thing that's credited with inventing the concept. It's a four bit, four bit, not eight bit, four bit. Uh, CPU, uh, which then turned into the 8008, I believe, which is 8 bit, um, uh, which then we get the 8080, uh, which turned into stuff like the Z80. Like, that's all the uh, Z80 is an 8080 derivative, and like the 8086. Uh, it's also basically an 8080 derivative. Not really, it's a from scratch design, but the 8086 was designed so you could assemble 8080 um, assembly programs with a bunch of custom macros and so on. So it's not binary compatible, but it was built so that you could take 8080 programs that didn't do crazy stuff like self-modifying code, um, which was actually not that crazy back in that day, but like, so like, well, we hey, for simple 8080 programs, you could, with a couple macros, assemble this 8086 code. That was a design feature that was um, required at the time that Intel thought was important. Then out of the 8086, they built the 8088, which is basically the 8086, but with an 8-bit data bus, half the size, which really doesn't work well for that design at all, but it's cheaper. Um, and that's 
like that got into the PC and that's how like we ended up with this mess where x86 is now everywhere. It's like Intel just had needed this cheap 16-bit CPU and then this they cut it down even further to make an 8-bit database version of their 16-bit CPU and then IBM wanted something cheap um, that was politically viable like there were other like they didn't want to do Motorola because they needed to like distinguish themselves from other competitors and so on but they ended up picking the 8088 uh, because it was cheap and the hardware was cheap and they just built everything out of spare parts and like built the PC and that's how we still have 8086s. Um, that's just random rant that has nothing to do with anything here with microcode, but it's just like whatever. Uh, you know me, I get rambly. Um, anyway, so like that's sort of the geneal genealogy of like microprocessors on the Intel side, the early ones. Um, but like the 4004 is the first microprocessor, like these were all really, really simple designs. Like another famous, like we have the Z80 here, which is one of the two big 8-bit CPUs. The other big one is the MOS 6502, um, which is like a separate thing that has its own lineage that's kind of descended from the uh, Motorola 6800. As you might guess, this, like, when Motorola then built a 16-bit chip with a 32-bit architecture, they called the, the 68000. Um, when Zilog later built a 32-bit chip, they called it, I think, the Z8000. What was that? Or, like, that was 16-bit and there was a Z80000 that was 32-bit or whatever. It's like... Everybody here had very, very conspicuous naming schemes, but like this was an, another uh, 8 bit CPU by Motorola. And then Motorola people split off and went and founded Moss and built. Like this thing here was something like 200 bucks in 1970 something dollars. And this here was more like. 25 or so so like or five or like this was intended to be cheap and motorola didn't want to do something cheap these guys wanted to build something cheap in mass market so they found their own company anyway we have now the error of um complete processors that are not built as a board anymore uh with lots of discrete logic elements but something that's really broken down really simple and tries to fit inside a single chip um and at the time with the level of integration you had in chips at the time, um, you couldn't fit that much in, into a single chip. Um, there was, uh, yeah, designs of that era, so late 70s, early 80s, up until the late 80s, are very, very size constrained. In the 90s, it started opening up a bit, and like people weren't completely limited anymore by what they could put inside a single chip. But um, yeah, late 70s, early 80s, very much size constrained, which is also why uh, stuff like floating point support and so on. Everybody had coprocessors for this, right? Uh, in this era, floating point would be like a separate chip. For x86, it was the 8087. I don't remember the names for um, Motorola and whatever. Um, but it was uh, this was everywhere. like. When IBM built the um, original RS6000, like there was like one chip for the CPU, and then there's uh, the core, the CPU core, and then there were like two chips worth of caches. And if you want a floating point, that was a separate chip. So it's like this is also multi-chip, purely based on what you could economically fit inside a single chip. We're past that now, but these were size constrained, and having this super simple data path. And then multi-step operations was a good way um, to fit a lot of useful functionality into a small design. That's where we originally get it from. So that's sort of my long-winded introduction to what it is. And now I'm immediately going to go um, to a concrete example, um, just so you can see like um, what kind of thing we're actually talking about here. So I'm going to look at the um, MOS 6502 that I just mentioned. Because the nice thing there is like for the 6502, like I'm just going here. 
uh, in these videos. I'm just going and explaining whatever processes I can actually find detailed docs for, because then I can be concrete and not just too hand wavy. Uh, so this time I'm going to do the 6502 because there's detailed design schematics that you can look up. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the 6502. This is a block diagram. Um, the interesting part here that we care about, I'm going to zoom out a tiny bit because it's a bit too much right now. Um, is this part here. Um, everything here in this area that I'm kind of mouse cursoring around has to do with instruction decoding. So what's going on here? Um, over here on the right side, like there's a bunch like input registers for the ALU. There's the actual ALU. There's like stack pointers here, there's program counter logic, there's an incrementer, whatever, for the program counter, there's the address bus, here's the index registers, here's the accumulator, blah, blah, blah. So like this is the stuff you think about as implementing the actual uh, user visible operations. Like if you think about like, oh, where does the add happen, for example, like here. Um, it's like the adder is right here. And like there's several switches here where you can turn it to uh, be either adding or ending or EOR as XOR, so exclusive OR, or ORing things together, shift right, it's like whatever. Like this implements like all the operations you can do that are just arithmetic and logic because it's the LU. There's stuff here, logic to deal with memory access. Um, that's all here. This part here deals with grabbing instructions from memory. So it's like, here's the, here's the data bus. It's eight bits, eight pins on the chip, and they can go either to the data side, which is like, here's the arrow that says load, um, where it gets loaded from data bus and then goes into the input data latch. This is if it's used by the program as data or it's for the instruction stream and then it goes to the left side here in this path and it goes into the pre-decode stuff. Um, I don't actually know what the pre-decode logic does specifically. Um, it still gives the instruction bytes through and then from there it goes into the instruction register which buffers what the current instruction is because instructions take multiple cycles on the 6502 generally. Like you need to hold this for several cycles which is why this is buffered in a register. So you don't want to do that read every single cycle. You do the read once, buffer it here. And from there, there's like stuff like timing and generation and so on that like this keeps basically track of which cycle of an instruction you're in and generates a couple signals. And from here, um, it grabs actually only, um, well, it grabs the byte values from the instruction register and which cycle I'm in, which turns into 21 control signals, um, which is a bit funky, but I'm not gonna go into why it's 21. Like it should be 22, uh, it's 21. Um, and that has to do with a weird feature of how the 6502 is built, namely no legal opcode can end with two one bits. That means that this, what they label here as the code ROM, um, is accessed with 21 bits instead of 22. Like there's, it would normally be 16 bits from the instruction, each instruction bit and its negation um, into this ROM. But because the last two bits can't both be one, like they can shave off one bit here and it's only 15 bits from the instruction register and then there's six bits that basically denote the current cycle that go into here. Um, and from here, like 21 bits in, then there's just like, here's a bunch of NOR gates is what this actually is in the 6502, I looked it up. It's not a real ROM, it's like, well, it's, like, it's a regular structure. Um, and that generates 130 different signals. And then it goes into the random control logic. Random logic is a term. Um, 
this just means it's like, okay, we need all these signals. Um, and for example, like this stuff here is sort of grouped. It's like, you can see like here, there's a signal called DL slash DB. That's gonna be data latch because that's DL slash DB and that's, that signal goes into the bus enable thing here. That enables the connection of the data latch to the data bus. Uh, there's DL ADL, which enables the connection from the input data latch to the address low bus, which is like this line here, ADL, and so on. So like, there's a bunch of basically switches you have to set to make um, this whole block of just pile of electronics, basically, um, just do the thing you want. And um, this turns the instructions of like, hey, you have an add instruction, needs to set a bunch of bits. Um, and like, as you can see, like even on something simple like the 6502, they generate 130 different control signals here. And after that, like they don't wanna fully, like these are the signals they actually need to drive the CPU. Um, I haven't counted how many of these are, this is like maybe like whatever, 50, 60, something like this. Um, and instead of like generating all of them, which is then somewhat messy structure and gets tricky maybe, um, like it just turns out to be easier to just have this ROM here, which is a regular structure, like have a couple simple circuits, like this is completely regular array. And you can see this on the die shot. Um, it's very, very distinctive. And then you get 130 bits out here and then you just do random logic. To, this is just, this is not called random logic because it's actually random. It's just because it has no particular structure. This stuff here is just an array of NOR gates that looks exactly the same, very, very re regular design. And this is like, oh, like I need to and these two things together and then XOR it with that. And that goes into whatever PCL slash PCL, for example, or like this here, like this goes into DB at whatever. So you just have a bunch of things that you just need and you factor this, and this is pretty common. Like you always have, like this, as I said, this random control logic is a term that you find everywhere. Like you have stuff that's sort of structured and like these 130 bits they generate out here, they will usually have a reasonably well-defined meaning for each of what these 130 bits are. And some of these bits are even duplicates. Like there's some that occur twice, some of these rows, um, purely because sometimes they need like, this is 130 bits, this is 130 wires. And sometimes they need to have a signal that they generated up here because they need it for some of these terms, they also need it down here. And it turns out to be simpler for routing purposes just to generate that signal twice uh, in this regular array. Um, rather than have to deal with like having this signal over here and then having to cross it through and whatever. And so it just gets complicated. So they went whatever, just generate it twice. Um, it's easier because wiring constraints and so on start to matter at this level. So this here is a CPU. Um, you could I think I would I think it would be fair to describe this as microcoded because you have this whole table here that says basically for this instruction, for this one instruction, but every instruction has a single byte that denotes the opcode that's in the instruction register. And then several bytes may follow that's like an extra address or a value or whatever. But like you read one byte instruction buffer it in here, and then after that what happens depends on the current cycle and so on. And that's all controlled by this logic and uh, by this ROM, which is basically the microcode and that goes into the random control logic. And that generates the actual signals that control what the machine does. Like that's how this kind of thing works in a CPU of that generation. Um, so that's, the basic idea of like classical microcode and this there's oh there's a somewhat annoying debate there's this notion of horizontal versus vertical microcode which is one of these flame bore things just like risk versus cisc um 
it's also like one of these distinctions that's kind of what exactly is what just gets really really fuzzy the idea with the horizontal microcode what you would call horizontal microcode is basically this when you just generate a ton of control signals that directly control every aspect of the data path so if your microcode just basically directly controls like everything else in here um that's horizontal microcode the alternative is vertical microcode which is when what's in your microcode store is more like it's not just a pile of like oh set this switch to that and this multiplexer to this it's more things that are like closer to real instructions um and that's the style we're gonna see like i'm gonna talk more about because that's the one that's probably more relevant in current designs the ones that do have explicit microcode are generally like when they have microcode um it's always somewhere in between right um but like for something like x86 like microcode will usually be in the form of micro ops um which is this unit of tracking unit of currency that's used inside the cpu and like these are basically still recognizably individual instructions and not just purely like oh set this switch to that in reality it's always somewhere in between but um the vertical thing vertical microcode is basically closer to an instruction sequence and horizontal is more like no all the control logic for the data path is in here um Uh, Ark Holmes asks, so is it basically that the instruction bits are addressing the decode drama and the data bits from it are the 130 bits sent to the random control logic? Yes, exactly. Uh, like the instruction bits and timing logic are hooked up to the address bus on the ROM. Yes. So what goes in here is like for the 8 bits in the instruction register, you can think of it like this. These are NOR gates, which are basically AND gates sort of like the inputs are inverted but never mind that uh, it's like you can think of them as basically end gates so um and these here are all um yeah you have eight bits from the instruction register each of which you get both the um value and its negation normally Except in the 6502, that's not quite true. In the 6502, bits, uh, like the most significant six bits, you do exactly this. You have both the value and its negation. And the last two bits are special. And they don't get four lines, they get three because of the aforementioned peculiarity where like no legal opcode has the last two bits both set to one. So they can save a bit there, uh, which is why this part that comes from the instruction register doesn't generate 16 bits it generates 15 and then there's six bits that basically denote the timing um, that go in here and then what each of these things in the decode rom does is just basically it can decide which of these instruction lines and which of these timing lines to are together so that basically boils down to like if if the instruction register has these has this exact pattern has like these exact values set and i'm in cycle zero then do this um that's one of the 130 lines so yeah so in this case the decode rom acts as the instruction decoder and the microcode is the contents of that rom which is how the decoding works yeah basically um so um I mean, the instruction decoder is the entirety of this thing, right? And it's like, especially if you start to get pedantic, it's just hard to say. Uh, it's somewhat fuzzy where exactly instruction decoding stops sometimes. Um, like what, what you still count as instruction decoding and what part is just basically routing or just random control logic on the data path is always somewhat debatable. Um, so for example, um, if you're in two's complement, one second, 
me do a new page. Um, so to have a concrete example, um, Basically, everything that's been relevant in the past 30 years is to his complement. There were some Burroughs machines in the 50s and 60s that were one's complement, and then Unisys still does variants of these that are now emulated to this day, and these are one's complement, and they're now actually starting to die out, but some banks, I just think, and some old companies still have these, and just, have custom code that they don't want to touch. And like, there's machines that use one's complement, but mostly these are two's complement machines today. And in two's complement, like the way you do A minus B, um, well, first off, you can always do A plus negative B, basically. Like these two are just strictly equivalent, um, right? That's just algebra. Uh, and then negative B turns out to be, uh, to use the C operator notation, this here is one's complement. Like this is just invert every bit plus one. All right, so this is just like, that's just basically the definition of two's complement. Negative B is encoded by inverting every bit and then adding one. That's in two's complement how we encode negative B. Um, and it turns out basically the way adders work, like very, very simple example A simple ripple carry adder basic idea is this you have these modules these blocks that are called full adders um, and each of them here has a carry in this is the carry from the previous bit. Then you have basically bit zero of A, bit zero of B, if you're adding A plus B. And then you have two bits out here. There's a carry out and there's a sum bit. Um, and the idea is that Basically, this thing, this full adder thing, you can write these logic equations out. Like this here has the logic equations C out. It's just the majority vote of A, B, and C in. Um, and the sum is a three input XOR of A b and c n that's just the logic equations for a full adder and like you can turn that into whatever circuit but like that's um so this is basically generating like this is summing three one bit values and producing a two bit sum the sum bit what's produced as a sum bit is the less significant digit of the sum and the carry out is the uh, more significant bit of the sum so this basically adds two or adds three values together, uh, two actual like source values and the carry bit, and produces as output one carry of, a carry for the next position in the sum bit, and the idea is that you can cascade these. Like the uh, the reason why you build them that way, um, a one, is that and why you draw them that way while like like. Why, are the, why is the carry input on the right side when the other inputs are on the top? And why is the carry output on the left side um, when the sum output is uh, 
at the top and the reason is so you can do this so you can just cascade these left to right And so that's just um, dot, 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 right? Uh, each of these generates one bit of the sum. This is not the fastest adder you can build. In fact, like this type of adder is the slowest adder, but it's also the smallest. Um, and you will see these types of adders wherever you either don't care about the speed and you just want it to be small or not in the way uh, or uh, like sometimes I think like sometimes it's just fast enough like I believe the arm one just had a ripple carry adder there's tricks here to make this faster the problem with the ripple carry is when the carry ripples like you add these two bits together and generate a carry and then so you can't have a situation here where like this is hardware, so all these inputs here start at the same time and go through into this full adder. And what can happen is that this here carries and that call then causes a carry here, which causes a carry there, which causes a carry there, and that, that goes through the entire chain of full adders. So the latency of the full thing of the uh, last sum bit basically goes from here all through all the full adders down to the last sum bit, the last carry bit. So these are um, slow relatively speaking um but this is kind of the simplest and the most natural in some sense out of topology and note that um each of these elements naturally has a carry in and this plus one here in the least significant bit you can very very conveniently do by just setting the carry in of this least significant bit adder to be the one. So turns out that even though this here, this very first here could in theory be something that just adds two bits, which is called a half adder, um, which has been pointed out by others. It's not a good name because like this full adder thing here is more than two half adders worth of hardware. Something like two and a half half adders this is what it takes. But, like a half adder is actually less than half of a full adder, but alas, who cares? Um, actually no, like the half adder is actually not even that. Half adder is just an XOR gate. So like the half adder name is just terrible, but the full adders are real adders. Anyway, um, this is the most basic adders. All the more complicated adders still have this initial carry input because it turns out to be really useful among other things for negation. Um, and like this here, this one bit, whoops, let me just, terrible um, as B carry in so what do you actually do if you want to do a minus B maps to this type of thing you have your adder here like this time I'm just gonna do whatever add right and there's still like a carry in and also in fact a final carry out that's usually there this is useful and like usually like in stuff like the 6502 or an 8086 an arm several architectures and all of them but in several like this final carry out is routed into some sort of status register and you can use it for add with carry operations and so on. So like this ca final carry out bit is useful and is usually plumbed through in some way or not usually, but often. Um, then you also have, and like, let's say we're an 8-bit CPU. We have an A operand and we have a B operand. So what I'm drawing so far just adds these. What you start doing, um, if you want to also support uh, not just A plus B, which is what this here computes, but also A minus B, 
um, you need to do this. You need to invert B and you need to add one. Um, and what you do, um, that instead of doing this here, this here is not B anymore, you just have a mux here. Which is, let's just call it not question mark. So like this has like a thing that says like either B goes in here, that's one of the options, or we have basically negate B. Like this is like the negate of B um, and that goes in here. Um, so this here selects, like you can also just, like I did this here as a multiplexer. Just put mux in here. Uh, you could also do this as an XOR gate where you XOR everything with this not bit. Like how the implementation exactly works isn't very relevant. Point being is like you, if you want to support both addition and subtraction, you don't build one block of hardware that can add and one block of hardware that can subtract. You build this kind of thing where A always goes in straight and B um, um, might either like, and like, yeah, B might either come in regular or inverted um, into the, and which, whether you want the regular or the inverted thing, you select with a control signal. Um, and of course, once you build this sort of thing, like this is usually not just your adders, your general ALU. And then you might decide um, that you don't, that you also want to support other operations where the right side is negated. You can see this in ARM, for example. Like ARM has um, like just plumbs this sort of through where you can just invert the second operand for basically all ALU ops. So ARM has um, AND, which is, like in C notation A and B. It also has bit clear, BIC, which is A and not B. It has OR, which is A or B. It has ORN. Well, this OR is actually written with two R's for symmetry, which is A or not B. It has EOR, which is A, X or B. And it has eon, which is exclusive or and then not. It's like, which is like in terms of spec, it's written as this, but it's actually the same as a x or not b. So you can sort of see like um, the pattern here. Of course, you also have add, and then you have which is a plus b. You have sub, whoops, sub, not sud, which is a plus not b plus one. So there, my point being, there's sort of a pattern here, right? Uh, <laughs> Arm decided that this not signal, they wanted to get a lot of mileage out of. And note that in these examples here, like whatever you set carry into, like these here don't go through anything that has carries. Uh, but like, so like the sub will also force the carry in to be a one, whereas a regular add will force the carry in to be zero. Um, or if you're on the 6502, you just require the programmer to like, uh, on the 6502, the carry input is always the carry flag. Like there's only add and subtract with carry and you have to manage that yourself. And they save a bit of control logic that way. <laughs> but in general, like, CPUs will sort of do this thing. And because they don't want to actually build a three input ad, you can also build that hardware if you want to, but nobody wants to. Uh, and instead of building a full three input ad, if you only need to add one, you can use this lonesome carry in bit. Uh, that's basically just, you get almost completely for free um, in a realistic ad implementation. It's not just ripple carries that have this, um, there's also more complicated adder architectures and like any real adder you're gonna see uses some hybrid of multiple techniques. There's tons of tricks here. There's books written on this. I'm not gonna go into this, but the basic idea 
being that if you want to support add and sub with the same data path, you just have this random not that sometimes needs to happen and sometimes not. Um, and it's controlled by this multiplexer. And in fact, if I go back to the 6502, note for the ALU, here's the A input register. That's exactly the A input I had. This is not the accumulator register. It's not the A register and 6502. This is just the first input. Um, and that, that one just here goes to the SB, which is one of the two buses here internally that goes to all the registers, right? Um, and so that's where that's fed from. And it can also go to the accumulator. And then the B input register, which goes to the DB, which is the main data bus, that one, note, that has this big fat block of inverters up here. These inverters are up here because they want to not just add, but also subtract. Note that there is no control signal here uh, on the ALU block. Like there's one a signal here that says some enable. There's no difference enable because guess what? Once you, <laughs> once you have the inverters, which is like literally all they give you, like they don't even do you the courtesy of setting the carry in for you. Like you gotta set that right yourself if you're gonna do a subtract. And you manually have to set the carry bit to one yourself uh, if you don't want the subtract to like be off by one. Like they literally just invert it. Um, th that's like here, this uh, DB add thing that goes into here. Um, neg negation of DB add. That controls of whether you go, whether this B input register is loaded from the inverters or the main. Uh, the uninverted data bus. But like, so the inversion you get, the carry you're on your own and like this circuit only adds, it does not subtract. Um, so, and like this, I'm going into this example first because it's kind of interesting. Like if you don't know how um, this part of computation works, oops, camera blocking bottom right text. I don't think there's any um, I'll need to check one second. Um, I'll zoom out a bit. So, but uh, I'll, I'll go back to that page soon. Um, but yeah, so the general idea here is that, like, yeah, even stuff as primitive of like, oh, I want to both add and subtract. At some point, you need to build hardware for it. And then, of course, you want to be clever and not have separate add and subtract hardware if you don't need to. And it turns out you don't need to. And that's why you have so many control signals because there's all these kinds of tricks. Like I said, like you want to have add and subtract and that needs, means you need these inverse and then instruction set designers like the people at ARM go like, well, if I need a way to invert the second input, I might as well also throw in all these other options. And by the way, if you're in case you're wondering, you bet that the encoding for these two instructions and in BIC differs in exactly one bit. Uh, I haven't actually checked, but I would be very surprised if this wasn't the case. So like this invert bit, like if you're designing the instruction set, you would absolutely just have this be one of the bits in the instruction field and have this all be very symmetric so that and, big, or, and, or, and, eon, and, eon all differ in exactly one bit and that's the operand to negate bit. And of course, add and sub. Like that's just like uh, the kind of thing you do. The point being, like the meta point being, um, like instruction sets already lined with these kinds of things in mind. And so even if you have something like microcode, you will still have this situation where like, oh, this one bit from the opcode is almost certainly like, if you need to have both of these options anyway for everything, you might as well. Um, have this one bit that you just plumb all the way through uh, because it's just convenient to do it that way. So um, that brings me to my next point after this um, somewhat lengthy digression. Well, not digression. I mean, I wanted to talk through like for a simple operation like add, like where do all these control signals come from basically? Why are there so many? And the answer is like, hey, you need enables for like these kinds of things, some and, or, or all that shift, right, whatever. 
Like all these enable bits need to come from somewhere. That's what your control logic does. And that's why there's so many control signals. But also it's like, yeah, you're kind of trying to be clever and cute and do all these tricks. And that's sort of how that happens. Um, anyway, next page. Um, so, um, what's next, a uh, good next point of transition from here? It's like, this is just going into like basics of all this control logic and like, you can either have like um, one direction is like um, uh, some processors microcoded basically everything. And especially in this era, like 6502, um, 68,000 uh, VAX, like I said, late 70s, early 80s, microprocessors, 8086, whatever, you name it. Um, was microcode already covered or we're still working towards that? Um, I'm just talking about microcode the entire time, Runa. So you don't have to worry. Like it'll be all microcode all the time and it'll also be on YouTube. So you're not missing anything. Um, but some processors microcoded everything um, used to be popular implementation style. Um, um, uh, like, m let's just say like makes for small designs, I guess. Or smaller designs anyway, than if you didn't do it. Um, and it's like, if you were in an era, uh, where your size constraint, that's a feature, right? Like if you're limited, if you're fundamentally limited in how much you can afford to even fabricate, because uh, you're like, there's only so much you can fit into that space. Um, and you don't want to make the chip larger because at some point the yields will kill you. Like there's, you can't make these arbitrarily large. Um, they just become too expensive to manufacture and it's not, um, you can't sell them at a profit anymore, basically. Um, so some processors microcoded absolutely everything. Uh, that's not uh, not true for most current processors. at all it's like especially um i think this microcoding everything they, um i think like one of the earliest architectures where there was heavy use of microcode was the system 360 by ibm so that was a whole family of uh, machines um this is a big effort you can read about a lot about it the mythical man month famous book is about fred brooks's experience managing that project uh, but the interesting thing with the um, System 360 is that it was basically the first time anybody seriously tried the idea of an instruction set architecture. Before that, every processor, every machine you built had its own instruction set and it did its own compilers, its own everything, um, own operating system, of course. Everything was fully custom. And then ABM thought like, hey, we want to design something. We want to specify one thing and be able to sell customers a machine of a size they can afford that suits their needs. And we just have multiple implementations of the same instruction set and the same architecture, hence the name instruction set architecture. So the idea was instead of having um, every single processor have its own instruction set, we just specify the instruction set and the binary code and so on. And the hope is that if a customer then discovers that whatever they're growing or their needs are growing or they just need more compute power, we can sell them a more powerful machine um, that runs the same code. At this point, it's like, yeah, everything is that way. Um, at the time, uh, 
it was a revolutionary idea, and IBM had no idea whether, whether it was even going to work. They hoped it was going to work. They basically bet their business on it in computers, but they had no idea whether it would actually work. Um, but um, the crux of why I'm mentioning this for microcode is so like they had the bigger machines of that had a lot of instructions basically hardwired um, into the machine, which is faster. Um, and they had stuff like, oh, if you need like this kind of stuff I mentioned, like, oh, sometimes you need an extra adder and like, you, like today you go, whatever, I'll put an adder in the load pipe and then I'll have the adder if I need it. Um, and just build two adders and like, at the time, especially like the low end modules were really, really cost conscious. And so like they had as little hardware as possible. Um, so they would need a lot of cycles for most instructions um, and were heavily microcoded. And as you got to the higher end models, less and less of the instruction set would be microcoded. Um, like a lot of it would just be direct and hardware. Um, which brings me to the next point. Um, you can always, like I said, like you can sort of think of the contents of this microcode ROM as, or with this decode ROM as microcode, but the subdivision between what exactly you consider microcode and what is just like, oh, like this is just a convenient way to do basically the custom decode logic I would otherwise do anyway, is kind of fluid. Um, like, it is just more convenient for designers to do something in a regular structure like this in a decode ROM. Um, whether you really consider that microcode or not um, depends. And like, it also depends on how much decoding you do here. Um, like microcode you see in current designs, when there is microcode as said, it's mostly of I briefly mentioned this earlier, it's basically mostly of what's called vertical microcode variety. If you buy into that whole distinction, which is sad, like a bit dicey, because all of this is super fluid. All of this is super specific to the implementation of the CPU that you're gonna do. Um, and I'm not sold on there being a really rigid uh, taxonomy. Like it's useful to think that there's like different styles of like, oh, either generate all these control signals directly um, and just store them in the table basically, which is like the horizontal microcode extreme thing versus like, oh, I just have like these super primitive operations here, like calculate address or like do memory access and so on. And these are basically individual instructions in their own assembly language, which is the other extreme. You can absolutely have Basically, like there's a continuum between these and nearly any point on that spectrum is a viable design and somebody has tried it at some point. So it's just not clear to me that this whole horizontal versus vertical distinction is that sharper boundary. It's just whatever. Uh, Coda says 68K is amazing. Actually, 68K is horrible to decode. It's horrible. Uh, it's uh, like as a program, it's really, really nice. But if you look at the encoding, it's like, who boy, like every corner, they just went like, oh, we can cram something in there. It's just not something you want to write a decoder for. Uh, you don't want to write a decoder for anything because ultimately the space always runs out and like you start doing these things. But 68K started that way, which is just bad way to go, bad way to go. Um, anyway. Um, yeah, so when I say that this whole microcoding everything is not true for current processors, what's the alternative? Um, what's the alternative? I'll just write it down. And there's a couple answers to that question. Um, like classic risk answer is is to keep the instructions uh, 
the instructions simple. Regular easy to decode. And then just use hardwired logic for everything. Like that's one option, certainly. So basically in the platonic ideal of a classic risk CPU. And it's like something like the early, like, yeah. Um, uh, maybe MIPS R2000 or um, also like the very, very restricted subsets of risk five or something go sort of in that direction. And then like, Everything that's been around for a while has kept getting more and more instructions. And I guess once you have hundreds of instructions, it's like like even ARM has over a thousand instructions now. Like once you have that kind of count, like there's like this, um, you fight hard as an architect for any kind of regularity you can keep, um, because all the exceptions end up screwing you in some way sooner or later. Um, but it just gets messy. But like the classic risks, like early, especially like integer only, like early MIPS, very, very simple to decode. You just basically have like, instead of having like a ROM here, any indirection, you just try to do it so that you have this instruction register, you grab a few contiguous bits and you can basically hopefully route that directly into this kind of like, you just need a couple gates here and there. And you wouldn't even have probably a central block that does this. You just have a bit of routing. Like in a RISC CPU, it's like, okay, like all ALU instructions, for example, like there would be just one major opcode that's like, oh, ALU operation, two operands. And then you have all these variants here, and that's usually then in some separate function field. And that function field here that controls all this stuff will just have a few couple of these control bits that more or less directly are fed into these sort of multiplexes that you already have. That's sort of the platonic ideal for risk is that you try to make it that way as much as possible. That all these things that you need as control signals are basically already present as bits in the primary instruction encoding. And you try to keep it really, really simple. Um, that's certainly one option. Um, and that's just basically heart wiring everything. Um, and like, that's the classic risk, but like then, uh, newer risks do the whole risk thing is kind of another terminology nightmare. So I'll maybe just not go there. Uh, that's just like, it used to be like all these classic risk designs by which I mean like the error between mid error mid 80s to early 90s um, you had a bunch of designs that were all based on a very similar philosophy made very similar design decisions and had um, as a result made sense to talk of as a class it's like all these designs like MIPS, Spark, uh, the uh, HP Precision Architecture PA RISC, um, SH1 and 2, um, what else? Um, the AMD, uh, was it 88,000? I think 88,000? No, 88,000 was Motorola. AMD also had one. 10k or something i don't remember what 30k something something um there's a bunch of these that are all uh deck alpha so there's a bunch of these that all have a large amount of substantial similarities 
they're all or yeah they're all load store architectures they usually have 16 or 32 registers they have an instruction encoding that's fixed size at the time they're all like fixed size usually 32-bit instructions uh, power is another one or like the ibm risk station rs6000 was risk so um at the time like if you say like it's a risk cpu like you would have a fairly good idea of how that CPU looked like because they were all very, very similar. Um, like the exact instruction set encoding and so on was different. Like some had this function, like some decided early on they wanted to have hardware floating points, some were late to that party. Um, they were different architectures with, with respect to memory management and so on, different ideas there. But like, especially like if you think about like the user level code, if somebody told you it's a risk machine, you have had a very good idea of what you would, were gonna get. At this point, this term is less useful because it's basically just a marketing slogan that everybody uses to just either like, in the early nineties, like these risk workstations were all really awesome and everybody wanted to attach themselves to risk and call things that really had nothing to do with this classic risk style risk. Uh, because like risks had this good name and then it's like, oh, like late, uh, mid to late nineties, like suddenly like the x86s start taking off like a rocket and just keep getting better and better and better. And like suddenly like all the risk workstations, like that whole market is drying up and there's less and less of these. And then people like, like turn into this holy war for right? risk goes bad and risk loss and whatever. It's just, let's just not go there. Uh, it's just, at this point when somebody says risk A, it's like, it's not really that well-defined a thing anymore because like, for example, like this whole risk versus risk dichotomy is like, it's pretending like all these risk machines were actually very, very similar. Um, if you say CISC, there's not a single machine that you think of that's CISC. Um, like the Burroughs stack machines that I mentioned earlier that are once complement are CISC, but so is the System 360, which is um, about like similar to say x86, except it's easier to decode instructions. So it's like, System 360 is considered CISCI, and they're still around, by the way, IBM Z series. Um, these mainframes still exist. They're still making new of them, new versions of them. The System 360 is alive and kicking. Um, after 40, 50, 50 years, um, that's one long going ISA. Um, so the System 360 and descendants are CISC, but they don't have any of the features that are really, really onerous for implementations, which is why it's still going. Um, the DAC VAX was very, very CISC, um, had very, had features that really made implementations hard if they didn't follow the microcode everything style, um, which ultimately meant that they weren't competitive anymore. The 68,000 also has, it's not nowhere near as bad, but the 68,000 has some misfeatures that make it a lot harder to make a, um, really competitive pipeline or like out of order, for example, implementation than they should be. Like 68,000 has a couple of gaffes in the instruction set design, uh, especially with regards to things like flag management and also just they support operations with multiple chain memory accesses, all of which are bad news. So some CISCs had features that really made competent implementations really, really hard. Some CISCs like x86 is considered a CISC but it turns out it has none of the features that make a fast implementation really, really terrible to build, which is why it's still around. And some risks like, okay, like MIPS and like risk five are quite risky, but kept getting less so. And like the definition of what constitutes a risk has changed. And then ARM is really not very risk at all, but it's customarily considered a risk CPU. Like if you look at the current ARM CPUs, generally like in the user level instruction set, an ARM CPU has more, um, way more 
instructions that internally break into multiple operations than x86 does, uh, which might surprise some people, but it's true. Um, anyway, that was another long, long tangent. But yeah, so what's the alternative for classic risk is to keep the instruction simple so you can just do um, everything just with hardwired logic. Or um, that's the other extreme, right? Microcode everything is the one solution. And risk was very much a response to this. It's like, no, we don't want to do, we don't want any part of this. We're going to go in the exact opposite direction, keep everything small and simple and just have logic to the decoding and not go into the microcode business at all. And today is a sort of compromise. Most of these architectures are somewhere in between. Um, in the sense like x86 and ARM are somewhere in between. Uh, some combination of the following three things. We have some hardwired instructions. And by the way, um, by volume, dynamic instruction count, dynamic instruction count is not like if dynamic instruction count means you're counting the number of instructions you're actually executing. Um, as opposed to static instruction count, which is like you're looking at the program binary and like counting instructions in the source. It's so like in a dynamic uh, static instruction count count each instruction counts each instruction once. Dynamic instruction count you actually run the code and count which instructions you're executing in any given cycle. So if you run a loop a thousand times, the dynamic instruction count for that loop will weight that loop by a factor of thousand. Okay, so that's an I um, So some combination of like completely hardwired instructions, um, which should hopefully be most of the instructions. Like on x86, like all x86 CPUs uh, that you're gonna find today have microcode, uh, but stuff like move, add, like even these kinds of ads here, like this one here, um, these are not microcoded. Uh, there's stuff in there that's microcoded, but like the basic instructions you actually see in most programs are not microcoded. So you have some combination of hardwired instructions. Um, and like some of which may be broken down into something like two or four, two to four, say a smaller micro ops. Actually, this should be a mu. I'm so used to typing this in ASCII, but it's actually a mu. It's like, so, so you have these hardwired instructions, a lot of which um, will literally turn to one instruction, like one micro operation. Micro operation is sort of this thing. Like, I'm going to define this in the next slide. Uh, but the basic idea is that some of the instructions you have generate one micro operation and like basically execute on the machine one to one and some may be broken down into a small sequence of like two or three or four instructions to give this example again like this sort of thing here um this might do this kind of thing internally like this calculate address thing is not going to be a separate step but like this thing where like, oh, you internally break it down into first a load operation that does this calculation. Uh, 
then the arithmetic, and then a store operation, that's absolutely the kind of thing that will internally get broken down to multiple micro operations. Um, so we have hardwired instructions, uh, micro sequenced instructions. I'll define what that is in a second. And microcode from a ROM. Whoops. Let's just redo this. And these days, plus patch RAM. Like the microcode ROM is not a pure ROM usually. How meaningful is dynamic instruction count with things like speculative execution? If you look at it in an architecture context, like yeah, what E. Cusillo, hope I'm pronouncing that right, says is correct. Like you basically look at the retired instructions um, for architecture evaluation. Um, but yeah, so, um, and as I said, so you have some combination of these hardwired instructions, some of which, but most of which won't break down to smaller UOPs. Micro ops, you have micro sequence instructions, which are basically these things that are somewhere in between. Um, so in the 6502 example, we have this timing generation logic thing, which is basically means that like we have whatever, like up to seven cycles here for an instruction uh, or six, uh, where every cycle does a different thing. Um, and that's basically just like, this is just generating timing information and this turns this whole thing into a state machine where an instruction will over a couple of cycles go through a couple different things that are generated. And you can, if you have a multi-cycle um, operation that takes several cycles internally, you might decide to micro sequence that. It's like, oh, like, Typical example would be divide. I'll have this example a bit later, um, where like a divide or square root operation, for example, uh, that might actually get delivered as a single instruction to say a floating point unit, and then internally does multiple things. But it's still like for the rest of the core behaves as if it's one instruction that just takes a long time. So internally there's some state machine that just tells whatever at, um, like there, like if you think of this, like not an LU, um, for just regular inter arithmetic, but something that does say like floating point divide, you would have some state machine logic here that feeds into these control signals that you can use to do some somewhat more complicated uh, sequences like divides or square roots, but they're not actually fully microcoded. And then you have actual microcode that comes from a ROM, and this is like an, basically an instruction sequence. Um, so it's a bit more complicated than that. So uh, yeah, microcode is just, this is closer, like this is sort of like an assembly macro, but um, sorry, I'm looking at the chat right now. I guess if the instruction only takes one cycle, you can skip all lines for the timing bits in ROM. No, 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 you can't. No, no, no. That's not how that works. <laughs> like, a, 6502 has no instruction that takes one cycle. It does not exist. No such thing. <laughs> in fact, that's one of the things that cons that's controlled by this logic is like when exactly the next instruction fetch happens. Like on the last cycle of any instruction is um, like, where's the signal that enables that? There is a signal that enables this. Um, like on the last cycle of an instruction, you need to explicitly start loading the next instruction byte. And like, that's just so like, there is no instruction on 6502 that takes one cycle. Um, they do not exist. 
Um, but B, like the time, like, that's just like skipping a bit here doesn't make any sense. It's just not like, it's not a sequential thing. It's hardware, it's parallel. Like all these bits are there, all this logic is there. Like, like this is just a wire. It's just that there's current flowing, or like, so if, the, yeah, if it's, if there's, if it's this NMOS, so there's actual current flowing, but um, like if it was CMOS, not even necessarily that, it's just voltages. And it's like, don't think of it that way. Like it's not, um, it's not that way. Like these bits are always there. Uh, the ALU, the stuff that computes the AND of the inputs, the OR of the inputs, the EOR of the inputs, all of that is always there. It might well always compute all the sum, the AND, the EOR, the OR, the shift right for everything you feed it into. And then there's just a final multiplexer that selects which of these results you want. This is not a sequential thing. This is hardware. Like there's just circuits here. Everything happens at once. Like skipping a bit here doesn't make any sense. It's not a thing. Um, I mean, within the ROM, you could skip opening up the gates from the address bus to your data cells. Like, no, uh, I mean, like any given line in here might not care about some of these bits, but that's just saying that like you're not like that address bit is not wired up to this thing. But this is just a big and anyway. Every every of the 130 lines in here, it's just a big and where you factor in some terms like. Some of these you might, like any individual control signal might care about and others might not. But like thinking of it like in terms of skipping individual lines for um, like optimization, or whatever, it's like, that's just not really how that works. Um, and you, I guess you could think of it, but that's just, it's a weird way to think about it. It's just like some of these signals care which exact cycle you're in and some of which, some of them don't. But that's about the extent of it. Um, anyway, so, um, next slide. So, um, at this point, I'm going to go a bit, zoom a bit out. So like a lot of people like have this mental picture, um, so uh, that like, and I'll write this, that it's the wrong mental picture immediately. It's like uh, microcode as some sort of, some sort of firmware or VM. Right, so there's this thing that I've seen a lot where people are like, oh, like whatever, if you want to add an instruction to x86, you can just, um, you can just do a mic uh, microcode update and then suddenly it does that instruction and that's not really how that works. Um, you can add instructions via microcode updates uh, as has happened recently with the whole Meltdown inspector thing, but you can't add an instruction just anywhere. It needs like you can basically smuggle in new instructions and paths that are hardwired in the hardware uh, to do a microcode access. But the part of the instruction set that is just hardwired here, this hardwired instructions that generate a couple micro ops, you can't just microcode those. You need, like, there needs to be, like, for something to be microcode, the hardware needs to know that when it sees these instruction bits, it's supposed to look into the microcode ROM. And because that's slow, because, um, like, there's all kinds of things that can't, like, that can't really happen for microcode. Uh, like, microcode doesn't really have branch prediction, usually, and, like, all kinds of other things. Uh, for reasons, I'll not go into that here. But um, so you 
can't just replace, like you can't take an x86 CPU, put in a microcode update and suddenly it runs ARM instructions. Like that's not how that works. Like any CPU you care about, be it ARM, be it x86, even if it has microcode as said, almost all the instructions you care about are basically hardwired, just as in classic risks. This logic here, like the equivalent of this logic here is more complicated. Uh, and it might have, uh, like even the regular decoding might have some PLA, some regular structured stuff here, but it's firmly on the like hardwired instruction side, more like the classic risks. And it's not regular microcode ROM. It's not something that has the patch mechanism. It doesn't have anything vast majority of instructions you actually run on a regular CPU are completely hardwired and are not patchable with microcode. There's all kinds of other things that are lumped into microcode updates usually, like that you can also fix with BIOS updates as things like chicken bits in the CPU. That uh, chicken bit is something that turns uh, on or off some feature that the hardware designers aren't sure whether it works because they didn't have the time to validate it or just turn on and off debug functionality or stuff like that. Um, so turning on and off chicken bits might fix or work around problems and just force say a CPU onto a slower path. Like some optimization gets turned off because it turns out to be broken. If they didn't have the test cycles to figure that out before they fab the design, it happens all the time. Um, but, um, that's not a microcode thing. That's sort of an orthogonal thing. So you should not think of the CPU as like, oh, it like it's just running a program that's in the microcode. And that program is what looks at x86 or ARM or power instructions that decodes them. And if you change that program, you can change the instruction set. Um, that's just not true. There's lots of details about the exact encoding, like whatever memory operands are always encoded this way. And that's just hardware logic. Like they have to be encoded that way because that's the hardware block that is there. And he just like x86 has whatever, like has um, 64 bit x86 has 16 general purpose registers. Like that's the number of numbers it has. Um, and that's, the size, like if you do register renaming of your register renaming table, and you just can't run ARM 64 bit, which has 32 registers on that ever. And the instruction set isn't the same and everything works differently. It's like microcode is not something, uh, at the risk of repeating myself, uh, that is just the magic underlying fabric of reality that everything goes through. Microcode is more like this escape hatch where they try to design all the frequent instructions so they're directly supported by the CPU. And then there's some instructions that either nobody cares about anymore, like there's like the BCD arithmetic instructions in x86 are a good example. Like um, nobody cares about BCD arithmetic at that level. Like people might still do BCD arithmetic, but they wouldn't do it with these instructions. So nobody has a use for these instructions anymore. Uh, they still need to be supported. Nobody cares about the quality of implementation of these. So they just sort of need to work. And there's no hardware resources uh, devoted at all to making them optimal. So it's just whatever. Like all the stuff you don't care about putting in your uh, hardware, uh, which then like adds timing constraints, adds design time and so on. That stuff you might shove into microcode. The other big thing um, that's a big source of microcode is all kinds of system instructions, stuff that sets system registers. Like, Hey, this controls the paging, this controls performance counters, stuff like x86 CPU ID, which is just this big thing that just basically gives you, does a table lookup and has like all these kinds of values that it returns to all these instructions, uh, are. A, not part of the regular flow of execution, uh, like they're not in a hot loop. And B, um, 
they have very complicated semantics. And that's exactly the sort of thing you would put into microcode. Then hopefully the feature disabled path isn't broken for checking bits. Yeah, uh, that's actually a thing. Like you would be surprised how deep that rabbit hole goes. Um, I know for a fact that Intel CPUs, for example, usually have these big red emergency switches that let you, for example, turn off all the caches. Just everything is uncached now. That's a chicken bit that exists. That's not something they would ever ship a processor with, certainly not. Um, but these things exist because what do you need to know about the way CPUs are designed? This is a long, long design time, multiple years. Um, you have a lot of simulation and so on, but uh, these things are complicated and simulators are slow. Like you can simulate like a modern CPU depending on like, you, first off, you only simulate one core, you have a really, really stripped down system. And then you can expect simulation typically to run at like something like a cycle or second, uh, uh, a cycle per second or like 10 cycles per second. Like if your people are really, really good and you have some hybrid thing, it might be a hundred cycles per second, but that's it. Uh, so you can't imagine how long it takes to boot windows on such a machine in a simulator. Like you'll just like, you can just forget about it. It's just never gonna happen. It's like um, the amount of testing you can do uh, with a design before you actually have the silicon in hand um, is limited because these CPUs when you actually have them, you can clock them at a gigahertz, four gigahertz, whatever. And they do billions of instructions per second. What you can simulate before you have a physical device is on the order of hundreds. Like if you have built, like depending in the middle of the design stage, you might build an FPGA and then you might be able to run it at a couple megahertz. Uh, and that lets you get some useful sim in. But the amount of testing they can do is just limited. And just every time, they built one of these CPUs. Um, they put in all these features, they have all these changes and like everything needs a chicken bit. Like everything they're not absolutely certain about and the amount of stuff that has gotten sufficient validation that they're absolutely certain is very, very small. <laughs> yes, there's not enough time in the world for that. So they can basically turn off absurd things that you would never turn off in any real CPU. It's like if somebody sold you a CPU that had this sort of stuff turned off, like, hey, we don't support any caches at any level. Like that's basically a brick as far as like running any actual code is concerned. But having these chicken bits means that even if there's like a major bug in the cache implementation, for example, uh -huh they still have this couple billion transistor chip and can run other tests and test the other parts of the chip at a gigahertz. And like running stuff, like testing stuff on a CPU that had to have caching disabled because it was broken and is therefore like a factor of a hundred or a thousand slower. That's like, that's still faster than your FPGA SIM is gonna be. So, you absolutely want the ability to disable all kinds of stuff just in case it's broken because the worst thing, the worst thing that can happen is that you have done this early spin of an ASIC, like a specific circuit. Um, you get it back, you hook it up, and you notice this is so completely broken that you can't test anything on it. It's just a brick. Because that means you just wasted a double to triple digit amount of millions of dollars, depending on something that's not gonna tell you anything. Um, I do have a YouTube and yes, this will get archived. Um, I can, I'll, I post a link, um, but yes, this is on my YouTube. Uh, so yes, there's chicken bits and you want to turn off absolutely everything just in case so that if you do testing, you can make progress even if something really, really fundamental is broken. Um, it's, well, anyway, so microcode is not some sort of firmware or VM that 
runs the entire machine. By the way, like this is talking about current CPUs now. Like CPUs were like microcode, like even in like the microcomputer case where like everything is microcoded, like the structure of the microcode and so on, and like there's still hardware decoders for things and so on. It's like even on something that is completely microcoded, like an early VAX and so on, you can just turn it into a CPU for a different instruction set by replacing the microcode. But it's a lot closer to a point where it would work than microcode and current CPUs is. Uh, like more useful picture. Microcode is basically quote unquote exception handlers. In the sense you would use say um, exceptions in say Java or C++. So you have these things that are not supposed to happen during normal execution and are rare but that's your mechanism. Microcode is your mechanism you use for this part that's not speed critical. It's not very important um, in terms of like, it's not, well, it's not, it might be very important like system instructions and so on, but it's not very frequent. So it just happens rarely. And like all the complicated stuff you try to punt there, punt there. So for example, and like I brought this example up a couple of times, um, namely the AMD Jaguar, it's featured in some of these presentations that I've done before. Uh, that's not because I love the Jaguar so much, although I think it's a nice well-designed CPU. Uh, the main reason I keep using the Jaguar for reference is that there's a lot of papers on it. Um, it's like lots of stuff, stuff like pipeline diagrams and so on you just don't get for like current Intel CPUs, but the Jaguar has them. You can just find them. Um, they're published. Another nice thing, um, so this here is a table. A Jaguar has this, like the official name is AMD Family 16H. Um, that's the Jaguars. And there's a software optimization guide that has like description of the pipeline and like all whatever branches, like this is all in branch prediction. <laughs> and it also comes with this table. This is some data points about the architecture. And then here's the table, the instruction latencies table where they just say like, okay, here's all the instructions uh, supported by the CPU. Here are the operands. Here's like what CPU ID flag it says it's supported by. And like it just says like here, how many macro ops are this? Like this is how many instructions it expands into. And the nice thing about and, like how long does it take? That's latency. What's the throughput? What's one of the throughput? That means just how often can I issue this basically? Um, or how many of these can I issue per cycle? Um, so the interesting thing is here, like these here, A, 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 D, A, M, A, S, X86 instructions are aforementioned BCD arithmetic. Absolutely nobody cares about these. Note these here are flagged as four, like four to nine macro ops. Like these expand into lots of uh, X86, like macro ops are like the X86 instruction equivalent sort of. Um, in that core, like they're like, well, it's like these macro ops are not very risky. They're not like Intel micro ops, um, because they do have like read modifier write stuff and so on. Um, but then they're sort of at the level of abstraction of like internal x86 instructions. As you can see, like these expand into four to nine instructions, but if something is microcoded, it says U code here. That's ARPL, 
which is a just requested privilege level, is one of the more obscure system instructions. This here is actually microcoded. This instruction here comes from the microcode ROM. These instructions here expand into four to nine macro ops, but they're not microcoded. They might be micro sequenced or they might be like some generate some hardwired thing. Because the usual thing is like basically if you actually go to microcode, it's just usually like a branch uh, in x86 CPUs. In the sense that it actually basically like now the decoder is re-steering and getting data from elsewhere. And usually you can't like in any given clock cycle, the machine can either fetch um, instructions from a regular instruction stream or it can give you data from microcode ROM, but not both in x86s. So that means that anything you want to be able to like, at least at the decode level to like finally interleave with anything else, uh, if it's microcoded, it can't. Um, note there's a couple other instructions here, like bit scans, for example, uh, BSF and BSR. Seven to eight instructions, not microcoded, not microcoded, just seven to eight instructions which is especially interesting since there's some almost equivalent instructions. I need to scroll to the right place here. Where is it? LZ count, leading zero count. Um, this is very, very close to what uh, the x86 BSR instruction does. But this here is one cycle latency in the ALU and like you can do two of them per cycle. Whereas BSR, eight macro ops, um, substantially longer latency. So sometimes like these small things make a big difference. Um, and the interesting thing is here, if you look at like which things are microcoded, like ARPL, which is an x86 instruction you've never heard about. Uh, it's like for the 286 segmentation features mainly. Uh, it's microcoded. Bound, which is an old 286 bounce checking instruction. It's microcoded. FAR calls are microcoded. I don't even know what CLGI is, SVM. Okay, that's a new instruction, some virtual machine feature. Um, CLI is cl clear interrupts that disables interrupt processing. That's a privileged instruction, it's system, and it's microcoded. This has something to do with task switching, likewise privileged. All this stuff, like conditional moves, like you see a bunch of SSE instructions here. Note all of these are expand into one instruction, macro instruction, and are not microcoded. Compare string and like some of these, compare exchange, this stuff is microcoded. CPU ID is microcoded, but if you look over here, in the floating point subdivision, BCD loads and stores, uh, this is two to the X minus one. It's like that kind of stuff is microcoded. Cosine and sine is microcoded. Um, support for 80 bit floating point is microcoded. But like the stuff you actually use, no, it's not microcoded. Like there's stuff here, like integer division, for example, like this get, generates two internal mic macro operations this takes 40 cycles but they're micro sequenced instructions like um oh crap sorry i've been narrating here over crap i've been scrolling over this thing the entire time and of course you can't see anything um i'm gonna have to do this again x87 is microcoded on modern x86 CPUs? No, but some of it is. So here's the spiel I've been giving you. Sorry. Uh, let me also like, uh, can I zoom this a bit? Better. That's the instruction. So this is BCD instructions here. Uh, four to nine macro ops. Like, sorry, I just like, Yeah, 
It's like, these are the BCD instructions I was talking about. 4 to 9 macrops, so basically 4 to 9 x86 instruction equivalents. Long latency, but not microcoded. Just like generates a bunch of different instructions. Here's some like AES instructions expand into like 200 instructions, like one of which is on the vector ALU and one of which is on the vector multiply unit, but not microcoded. ARPL is microcoded. I mentioned that bound. Um, far calls, like all these here, like the system instruction stuff in particular. That's the kind of stuff you see microcoded. All the other stuff, like compare string uh, here and compare exchange, this stuff is microcoded. Uh, CPU ID is microcoded. Um, more BCD instructions. These are like 16 cycles or 16 internal instructions, but not microcoded. Um, so yeah, basically most of the user mode instruction set is not microcoded with some exceptions here for x87. So like add, um, change sign, not microcoded. Uh, BCD loads are microcoded. 2 to the x minus 1 is microcoded. Conditional moves are microcoded, interestingly. Um, the floating point conditional moves um, on the x87 sub. Like this here is just like microcoded, but it's like one operation. So it's like this is just like this is like they just didn't care. Like just don't care. Like especially like this is just adding insult to injury when it goes to microcode and it's like one or two instructions. So if it's expanding into internal multiple internal ops, let's look up for that similar to the 6502's decoder ROM or is it more low level hardwired stuff? Can be a bit of both. It's just somewhere in between. It depends on the implementation. I don't actually know, but it's like usually it's like something in between. Like um, I mentioned this also earlier that like in something like um, x86, which is aggressively variable length, um, it's a major production to just figure out what the length of an instruction is. And then you'll have stuff where um, like say the length decoder for an instruction is in a completely different part of the chip than the thing that actually like figures out what the instruction should do. Because the length decoding you need to know to know where the next instruction starts. So that's a fairly speed sensitive thing. So you'll see things where the length decoder uses like something that only sort of approximately matches x86 instructions, but close enough to know what the right size is. And that's all they care about. And that may be some like usually structured logic like PLA sort of thing. Um, Whereas like the actual decoder might be more complicated. So like it's just all this hybrid thing that's sort of in between. Note like floating point, like stack manipulation, like this stuff here is all quick. Divisions, floating point free, integer add, integer division. That part of x87 is quick. The stuff that does deals with 80-bit floating point numbers is not. Or load control word. What else do we have? Fn in it. This is a like this stuff is like reset kind of things for the FPU. So that's save and restore environment. That's also like store status word. Um, this is actually like used in x87 code, but like partial arc tangent and partial remainder. Like that's a bunch of operations here. So like even for x87, which the Jaguar explicitly does not care about. Like they state outright, there's a paper on the FPU and they specifically said, I can actually quote this one second. So I do have the paper here. And this time I'll put it on the right screen. Um, where is it? Uh, Since the Jaguar FPU is optimized for SSE and AVX single precision performance, x87 performance is explicitly de-emphasized. With this target market, the design assumes that the 8x87 registers will be often unused. 
So they support it for completeness sake. Whenever something is cheap enough to support, they throw it in. But otherwise, it's just like, no, like, don't care. Anyway, that's floating point. There's a bunch of like port IO and like interrupt instructions here, page and validation stuff, interrupt return. But like, yeah, like, um, the stuff you see microcode for is like stuff, basically anything to do with segment registers, with access rights like this here, machine status registers. Uh, that's the stuff that's microcoded on x86s. Uh, anything to do with segment registers is microcoded because by the 286 segmentation model, loading something into a segment register involves a complicated privilege check which is why this stuff is microcoded, like all these kinds of things. That's also like stuff to do with like task collectors and task registers. So like all that stuff is microcoded. But the entirety of SSE, like what's the move string, move is Q, you get the idea. Like you do see a fair number of microcoded instructions, but it's not the ones you'd use. And if you get here into the MMX and SSE subsets, like, oh, P add, blah, 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 blah. Everything is like one instruction, um, one macro up straight. Then there's pause, which is like, okay, spin loop, that's microcode. Uh, and then over here, it's just like, yeah, it's all just numbers. So you get the idea. Um, there absolutely is a lot of microcode in this, but it's not, um, in the sense that like all the vector stuff is here, um, then they just have a list of instructions they don't support here. Um, yeah, you get the idea. There's just a lot of instructions in this, a lot of microcoded stuff, but not for the stuff you use often. It made Quark, Intel Quark. That's one of the P54C derived designs, like the microcontroller version of the Pentium design. You can look it up on your own homepage. For the company you work for, you should know this. And as Edison and so on. Uh, it's a thing. Anyway, um, and yeah, so like this is uh, the Jaguar FPU paper, which has a couple other choice details. Like it's actually fairly interesting if you care about how that stuff works. Like here's, for example, um, this is the square root algorithm. Note that this is explicitly given as a program, right? This is what this thing internally computes and it's using like reciprocal square root uh, estimate, iterative multiply 27 by 76 bits. This here's, um, I'm not actually sure what COMP3 is. Um, I don't actually know. Um, so there's couple magic like last mole at back mole round cell. Like this is the sort of thing, like these kinds of magic operations, like this is a special magic multiply uh, that also adds a specific value under certain constraints that's only used in the last stage of a square root computation. That's exactly the sort of thing you might have internally that you're not exposing in the instruction set because that's the stuff you want to change. But note that even though this is given as a program, um, if you look here in, the, in this PDF, or not PDF, in this Excel table, not here, notice square root PS even, like packed, right? This is four square roots at once. Um, SSE AVX square root PS, um, this program here is one macro operation. Happens to take 21 cycles, but this is not microcoded, even though it's given in the form of a program, because it turns out this diagram here, these are the 21 cycles for square root PS that tells you in each cycle what each pipeline stage is doing and this stuff here, and that's like sort of um, 
where I get back to this is absolutely, um, whoops, micro sequenced. It's like, that's what I mean with micro sequenced. It's like, this is some multi-step operation that somebody has lovingly laid out. It's like, here are the parallel things I can do in the different pipeline stages. It's like, this is like generating these internal control signals. This is still just a pipeline diagram. But like, um, there's explicit magic control stuff going on in several of these stages to do the square root algorithm. And it's lovingly mapped onto the hardware in a way that can be expressed neither in regular x86 code, the instructions you would need don't exist, nor even in the microcode ROM. Because like this means like sometimes it's like, it's interleaving things in a weird way that you can't actually express with, through the register renaming and whatever logic. It's just doing magic in the hardware. So um, that kind of stuff exists, but that's still not really my code. So, uh, so that's why the Jaguar is a good example to use for this kind of thing, because as said, there's enough docs and papers on this where you can actually like poke into the details a bit and see a bit more about what the various things are. And so as a general rule of thumb, if you're wondering whether something is microcode or not, uh, if it's an instruction you've never heard about or don't know even exists, there's a good chance it might be microcode. Um, if it's a system instruction or um, something to do with exception handling, privileges, system registers, uh, it's almost certainly microcode on x86. Almost everything else, uh, even if it's somewhat onerous, even if it involves multiple smaller operations, is probably not microcoded. So the stuff that is microcoded uh, is, with a few exceptions, um, like really, really weird, rare stuff. Like I believe on x86, like Intel x86, um, not the drag word, but like uh, Intel like has not put a dedicated integer divider into anything in a long time. Um, even the original Pentium didn't do that. The 486 had an integer divider. The Pentium did not. The Pentium has a floating point divider and integer divisions are just uh, shoehorned into the floating point divider. And like there's some sequences to do with integer divides that I believe are actually microcoded on Intel CPUs. I believe floating point divides, even though they generate multiple operations, are not microcoded. Like they're micro, they're more on the micro sequence side. So, all right. And then like I could do a whole spiel here too about like, if you're gonna do microcode, like how does say x86 microcode look like? And actually, let me look that up one second because there was actually a paper recently um, where somebody um, successfully reverse engineered um, AMD K8 and K10 microcodes. So that's not their current CPU generations, that's a couple generations back. Um, but the, they do have these microcode update blobs. Um, that are used uh, at boot time for the patches and like some of the Intel stuff for that. Ah, uh, see, I just lost connection. So um, if you'll see this later on YouTube, you'll, you should still have this, but um, I'll not talk right now for the people who are on the stream. All right, we're back. So 
thing I was saying, like somebody actually managed to successfully um, reverse engineer AMD K8 and K10 microcode. There's these blobs with microcode updates that control the data in the right format. Um, Intel has, as far as I can tell, always used like, there's like actual like hardcore crypto on that stuff. They do not want that getting out. Like there's actual RSA crypto on these things. They need to be signed in the firmware, like not in the firmware. The CPU actually checks these on upload and so on. It's like whatever. Like this is actual like private key crypto. So like Intel does not want these getting out. The older AMD micro blobs um, are not as secure, turns out, and somebody reverse engineered from it. And by the way, Intel has an AMD as well has good reason to hold these close to that chest because um, as I mentioned earlier, like a lot of the stuff implemented in microcode is system instructions, stuff that deals like with system registers, with privilege checking and so on. That is stuff you want strong crypto around your update mechanism because if somebody can mess with that, somebody can sabotage all the privilege checking in your CPU. It's like, this is not just them not wanting the dirt to get out. Like this is an actual major security threat. Uh, if somebody can wrap microcode, like microcode can do things uh, and like work around privilege checking mechanisms that are implemented in microcode, which is a lot of them. So it's potentially really dangerous if a user can upload new microcode and they figured out how for some of the old AMD CPUs. Um, so yeah. Anyway, this is some introduction to microcode, horizontal, vertical, whatever uh, encoding. Like we went over some of this. Here's basic description of like how the microcode update mechanism works. Basically, like there's, you get a handful of patches you can wrangle in using the microcode update mechanism. The assumption is, um, and that's just basically wired into the address path. Like I'm not, I'm not gonna go over this paper too much, but um, I'm gonna show you some of um, where do we have it? This is bits from an actual microcode ROM array. And where do we have some of the microcode? So they worked out some of the internal encoding of, um, this uses a, like these CPUs, K8 and K10, use a 64 bit per instruction microcode format that has a very regular structure, somewhat risk-ish. Uh, so like this looks like the sort of encoding you would see for a RISC CPU that has 64-bit fixed instruction sizes. It's so like this stuff is exactly the kind of thing, uh, like in the microcode ROM, you have instructions that are still somewhat um, um, cooked, like they're not fully decoded. It's not the fully horizontal microcode thing. Like this is like I said on the more vertical side, but it's like a RISC CPU. So it's designed. So this is like super easy uh, for hardware to wrangle, right? I think you can see that here. Like there's four operation classes. Like you can tell them apart by this bit. So like this stuff is like easy mode. Um, and there's also like a sequence word here. Um, so I th think, yeah. So, this, these are CPUs that have um, three instructions per clock cycle. And like the microcode of ROM just has like three of these instructions side by side because it can do three instructions per clock cycle. Um, and if you don't need that instruction slot during that time, you just put a knob there. And then uh, in addition to these three instructions, you also have like the sequence word here, which is just like, just tells you where to go next. Do we lose connection again? I don't know. 
you can just like otherwise you can just see it on the um, YouTube layer. But yeah, so this is just like this is the code that it has for the microcode that's a lot simpler. And you can assume that the decoders, the regular x86 decoders, internally produce something of this form or very similar to it. Like these are the instructions that the machine internally uses. So x86 instructions get decoded into this form, this sort of thing. You can also imagine that Intel CPUs will do something similar. They have some internal fixed encoding that is certainly RISC-ish, um, the way you would have it in a RISC CPU. And that's also the stuff that gets um, stored in, say, a micro-op cache and so on. It, that'll be a lot closer to this than it'll be to regular x86. But importantly, it'll also be a lot closer to the size, i.e. 64 bits per instruction, than it will be to regular x86 instructions. So that's the trade-off right there. Um, anyway. Um, do I have some? Yeah, they don't really, oh no, here's. <laughs> here's ROM addresses uh, in the microcode ROM and uh, instructions they map to. So these are, yeah, some of the hotter instructions. And yeah, collection of microcode operation types. Looky here, add, or, add, carry, subtract with borrow, and sub x or compare test. Logical, rotate and right, uh, rotate, uh, yeah, rotate left and right, shift left and right, and so on. It's like, as I said, this looks like an ex, uh, like a risk-ish instruction set now. Um, Here's some of the register name encodings. Um, note here, um, that, um, how do I explain this properly? Um, these are regular x86 instruction names. Um, these are also used, like, Microcode needs to refer to that because if something has, like, say, an operand in the AX register, it needs to go th be able to go through the register renaming tables and so on to figure out what that actually is. But then microcode also has, like, these values here. Like, this T stuff is temporaries. Um, back in my earlier notes um, here, you notice this thing where it's like, oh, calculate this address and store it in a temp variable. Um, where do we have it? Come on, this here, right? And I needed a second temp variable here. Uh, there's actual temporary registers for microcode use. Um, so these are registers uh, or register names even that exist in the machine, go through the register renaming mechanism. They're not available for regular code. They're only used for microcode. And this matters because for microcode, you have the problem that even though you're internally running an instruction sequence, um, for the purposes of somebody like single stepping it through the debugger and so on, it needs to look as a single instruction because that's the semantics of that in the architecture definition. So you can't write anything to any register at all until you're certain um, any of these registers, you can't write to it all until you're certain that you're gonna successfully complete. Uh, so if you do any memory accesses and so on, you have to write all that stuff to temporary registers because the memory accesses might cause exceptions. And like only if all that succeeds are you allowed to write stuff back to the main registers. Yeah. And yeah, here's some
Yeah, they just have some example programs here that they did for their <laughs> microprogram that inter intercepts the x86 instruction SHRD, shift right double, and inserts a bug that can be leveraged for a bug attack. This is, of course, evil. And, like, yeah. And the other, like, they have a couple instructions here that are microprogrammed on the um, K8 and K10, which is a shift right double and like divisions, like divs, another one. And like those, basically in this paper, they put um, evil, evil uh, payload in there by hijacking the microcode ROM to put other instructions in there uh, that let them do the evil ends. But yeah, um, this just to give you some idea of like what microcode looks like. It looks like, note that here it really like, this is like the typical way this stuff would look. Like this uses all temporary registers all the time for the entire microcode flow. And only at the very end do you reference anything um, that's through regular registers basically. It's actually not a good example because it's, this is a more interesting thing. This stuff here, rec MD, rec D, um, you have say an instruction that has multiple register operands and you don't know which register you need to write to. It's so like there's special encodings like for whichever register corresponds to the register that was the output of this instruction write to that one. Um, that's like this shift instruction here has rec MD4 and rec MD6. Like that's referring to instructions from the source instruction template. Like there's specific things here that are really just, yeah. Trickery to make that be useful basically. But that's also like, sometimes people go like, oh, like basically give us the magic instructions from the microcode, like why don't, why can't we write code like that ourselves? And like, the answer is you can totally write code like that yourself and you can just write it using regular x86 instructions. Like there's fundamentally nothing very magic about the stuff that's in there. It's just, it runs on the same hardware. Like it's not like they're really keeping any fundamental hardware features from you. Um, it's just, um, yeah. That's, how to, uh, how to explain this? It's like, sometimes like, why can't we just wrap microcode yourself? Like, there's no point. Any stuff that is actually fast in the hardware, they will do their best to actually plumb it through so you have it as a direct instruction. The stuff that microcode gets access to, um, in addition to that, is not stuff that is generally useful. It is either things that are like highly privileged, like writing to system registers that might also change in every implementation, or it's stuff that are just like obscure instructions, like the thing we saw, um, where was it, the Jaguar FPU paper, like this, like there might be internal operations in the FPU for like, oh, iterative multiply, and here's the last multiply add for like a square root instruction. And there's like this magic rounding operation, the magic back multiply. But like, that's not instructions that are generally useful. And like, these here even use parts of the register, like 76 bits, like this stuff here needs to be computing using 76 bits of Mantissa. Um, even though like the actual operands here, or like, sorry, this here, like this for single precision, um, 27 bits of Mantissa, and you only actually have 24 bits accessible. Like this is an algorithm that needs to compute couple extra bits is not, and it turns out they can make it correctly rounded with this magic fix up sequence. But it's like, these are all multiplies that sort of don't really have the right semantics. These here are truncating, they're not rounding. There's all kinds of weirdness in here that they really don't want to expose because it's just something that also changes for uh, from every implementation. Like you might do square root this way in one architecture and do it another in some other architecture. So it just gets messy. And that's really the stuff that's a microcode. Just has these extra widget instructions that do something 
that's useful in a very specific context that happens to matter for like one instruction sequence they really care about, but it's not like there's fundamental features of the machine that are locked away from you because you don't can't write microcode. Writing and using regular x86 instructions tend to be faster or slower than using the microcode at once. Um, it depends what you're doing. If it's something that's one or two instructions, x86 is absolutely always faster. No question. Um, if it's a lengthy sequence um, that needs things you don't directly have access to, um, microcoded things might be preferable. Like the, as said, there are some things like that you can't really write in regular code because like whatever, like the extra bits in the FPU, for example, that exists on the Jaguar, like where like, yes, it can do floating point multiplies with a 27 bit Matissa for single precision because it needs that internally for its divide and square root algorithm. That's not something you have access to. All the operations you have access to from x86 or SSE instructions round to 24 bits mantissa because it's what IEEE says. The iterative multiplies that they use internally are not something you can access. And if you were trying to write an, a 27 bit floating point multiply uh, in x86 code, it'd be a lot of instructions. So like, if you need something like that, then sure. Um, like, there are things you can absolutely do using like these kinds of internal things um, that are way faster than anything you can do in x86. But as I also said, like if you're going into microcode, that's like basically, it's sort of comparable to a function call as far as the CPU is concerned. It turns into this one cycle boundary where you're going to a different thing and microcode, um, like stuff like string instruction, like if there's any decision-making in microcode, microcode doesn't really have a branch prediction mechanism usually. Because the problem is branch prediction, everything to do with branch prediction is very closely tied into this whole concept of instruction addresses. And your microcode doesn't have any instruction addresses. Like the instruction address for microcode is whatever actual instruction address the machine has. And then now there's a second instruction pointer. Like while your main instruction pointer is like stuck at that one instruction, like whatever, say it's a divide that happens to be microcoded. Um, like the actual like architectural instruction pointer is stuck at that the entire time while you're executing this like whatever 20, 30 instruction sequence that does uh, implement the actual divide. And all the branch prediction stuff is just hardwired. Like everything to do with branch prediction goes off the actual address, like the instruction address, not some random pointer into microcode that lives somewhere else entirely. So like microcode usually doesn't have branch prediction at all. Uh, and if microcode needs to do branches, that kind of sucks because it needs it will like not have prediction and it'll like probably flush the pipeline a lot, which is not ideal, but like them's the breaks. You could build a specific branch predictor just for like microcode sequences, but nobody's going to because by definition, the stuff you put into microcode is the stuff that you're not supposed to be doing all the time. Um, so it's like, there's special things you have access to inside microcode, but there's also just like, there's a lot of fundamental features that you're missing that you don't get access to. So yeah, it's not the fastest thing. And the other final thing I wanted to mention, and like that's the last thing I'll mention because it's uh, been long enough already. One second. Because I did mention this earlier, um, but I didn't like, give you any proof. Um, so I want to show you some examples. I need to download a couple PDFs right now. Sorry. Yeah, this here is the ARM Cortex-A55 software optimization guide, which happens to contain a bunch of details about various instructions. Point being, it does contain a bunch of details um, 
about execution characteristics of the various instructions. The interesting thing here is, especially if you go into, say, the advanced simd load col column, um, this Cortex A55 is a dual issue superscalar CPU, one load pipe, one store pipe. And interesting thing here is like execution throughput, like regular load, one element, one register is like throughput of one, meaning you can do one per cycle. Um, this load here, one element, multiple two registers has a throughput of one half. Uh, meaning you can do one of these every two cycles, which is a bit of a hint, considering this also loads two registers. And the latency also keeps, like, as you keep adding, like, extra registers to so loading, there's, like, one, two, three, and four register load variants. Um, this is a 32-bit uh, version. Like, magically, every extra register you load, the throughput seems to get, like, worse, and, like, it like this one it takes one cycle to process this takes two this takes three this takes four and the latency also magically grows by one cycle every time so like that's your big hint right there that this here is internally probably sequenced into like one two three or four loads um and then there, there's these here like um where some of these like one over five like this takes like five internal instructions evidently um six simd load one element multiple four registers q form eight internal instructions uh, now arms don't actually have microcode usually um like cortex a55 certainly doesn't but they do have internal sequences and like uh, combinatorial logic that does this kind of microsequencing I've been mentioning. And like, yeah, like that's a thing. So ARM is, as I said, usually considered a risk. And it's certainly, um, it depends on how you want to mince words. And like, uh, like it's probably a fair character characterization, but it absolutely has like, especially on the SIMD load store side, like here, nine cycles or not at least like nine internal instructions um these are some fairly long sequences to do with basically load and store operations and like that extends all through here so yeah um and um so where x86 is often like oh it's just like basically like um trans translates everything into micro ops that are basically risk I'm a bit annoyed with that definition because a, um, like risk as said is a reaction to heavily microcoded CPUs, like, but like every microcoded CPU ever has these internal small operations that everything translates into, and like saying that oh, like. Because these are like internal, like these small, simple operations that really makes them risk. It's like, no, that makes them internal operations that are designed the way internal operations have always been designed. Like as long as people have been doing this. And like, yeah, like saying like, that's one of these things like, oh, it's like, like this argument, therefore like, this is a moral victory for risk. It's like, no, like people are doing this the exact same way they were doing this before risk was even around. And like, it's just silly to claim that that's a risk thing or that that's really risk or more risky or whatever. It's just, yeah, it's just pointless. Uh, there's a lot of just bad takes on that subject and I find them annoying. And so I'm kind of ranting about this and I should stop. But the point is like, this is ARM. Um, most operations in here, except for like maybe divides, like these are, uh, again, micro sequence thing, it's on the divider. Um, I believe you can do other stuff while the divider is running. I would need to check. Let me actually see. I think it's here. Um, Integer divides instructions are serializing and do not allow younger instructions to retire underneath. Okay. So this is not. Okay. So these are basically blocking. Like sometimes, like, like for example, the Pentium had a weird thing where 
floating point um, divides would allow other instructions to retire underneath them. And MIPS did something similar with their multipliers and divides. So like multiply and divides is like common thing that takes several cycles that people might play tricks with. So the machine is not completely in order where they're concerned. Um, but yeah, it's a thing. And finally, um, the other PDF I just downloaded, Cortex A57 software optimization guide. So A55 is a fairly new um, in order CPU. Like the SOCs with that, I think just like hit this year. Like it's the design's been around for a while, but it's like since ARM design season and announcement season, then it takes a while for people to integrate them into the designs. Uh, I don't think many things, many devices with uh, Cortex A55s have shipped yet. A lot have shipped with the predecessor, which is the A53. The Cortex A57 uh, was released about at the same time as the A Cortex A53. The 55 is a lot younger and is an out of order design. Um, and the interesting thing with the Cortex A57 is that, um, first off, like this whole thing with like, in exactly the same group, like Cindy stores and so on, like yes, eight cycle expansions, six cycle expansions, like all the way for the Cindy stores. The more interesting stuff though, um, if we go away from like the Cindy-ness here for a bit and just go to regular integer arithmetic and just scroll a bit up, um, like multiplies a somewhat lower throughput, but that's not unexpected. That's it, that's pretty common. More interesting stuff is that um, where do we have it? So like here's the basic integer instructions and so on. Oh, sorry, I misremembered where I wanted to scroll. <laughs> You can see like most of these are like basic instructions and go to one pipeline, whatever. Then we have stuff um, also on the loads, but this is on the integer side. Um, load register offset plus. Um, so ARM lets you do addresses that are register plus another register. And like that goes to the load pipeline. Um, load register offset minus. Because turns out the load pipeline does not support both additions and subtractions. So if you do a minus there, which 32-bit ARM lets you do, 64-bit ARM does not. Uh, suddenly, um, that decomposes into two operations, has an extra cycle uh, of latency, and turns into one integer operation, which computes the address and one load instruction. Um, and as you can see, there's a couple others here load instructions specifically. Um, just basic loads that are just in the ARM 64-bit architecture definition that occupy two pipelines. So this is an ostensibly risk CPU. Um, to be fair, I said ARM is not uh, is certainly not nearly as risk as say risk five is um, like in terms of purity of the design. But like this isn't the CPU that's usually considered risk and that absolutely does cracking of instructions into multiple smaller microops uh, for a lot of things. You can see like this whole thing pattern here where like uh, an instruction goes to two pipelines. Absolutely, like that's all over the place. Um, so yeah. Anyway, uh, I think that's about enough on that topic. I've talked for long enough. Um, so uh, at this point, I'm just gonna ask if you have any questions, want me to explain anything else. And if you don't, um, then I hope um, that's been useful or informative and uh, I'll end it here. So yeah, if you have questions, feel free to ask now. I'm looking off camera right now because like the chat is on the other window. <laughs>
uh, other screen. Also other window, but also other screen. Tangential, but do you know much about the binary blobs in the i915 video decode and encode drivers? Intel told me I could think of them like microcode shaders. I have no idea. I, uh, what that probably is, is like probably actually like um, basically, there's a couple things like that. Um, so, for example, um, one thing I know for several GPUs. Um, several of them basically have the thing that parses command buffers um, on the GPU end is usually at least somewhat programmable and is in some cases very programmable and you basically upload the program that actually does the command buffer parsing to that thing uh, at initialization time you can sort of like, you can think of that as a driver or maybe a shader or so on. It is software that's running on that thing. Um, sort of like a micro up there, but it's just a different thing though. I mean, like a lot of these things are basically literally just software, especially like if you have video decoding stuff, there's, um, effectively like yes said like these might run on the shader cores they might run on the, the separate dsp but it's really just software um it happens to be distributed in a binary form because it's for a uh, piece of hardware that you are not intended to for whatever reason uh, to write code directly but it's just software the microcode stuff that i've been talking about here um is How to explain it's somewhat similar in function and that if you have say um a hardware block that is whatever meant to decode h264 video um the way that usually goes is there's some parts of that that are actually complete hardware blocks like whatever bitstream decoding the cabac that stuff is usually completely a hardware block and then if you didn't have an h264 encoder in something um you might have the bitstream decoding and writing hardware blocks but stuff like the motion search will usually be written in code just for a fairly generic DSP sort of thing. Uh, and it's really just code. Um, but at the same time, that hardware block is just advertised as like, no, that's the H264 block. And the fact that that happens to be something that has hardware support for some pieces of H.264 and a fairly generic programmable DSP that just happens to be running software that encodes or decodes H.264 puts us in somewhat of a weird space. If you think at it as, uh, as, if you think of it as a consumer just buying this thing that's supposed to be the video encoder, then unless you have that software installed, that piece is not working as advertised. It's only action H264 decoder block if it has the code loaded that does H264 decoding. Otherwise, it's something else. It's like uh, it's something that just does your own thing, whatever. Uh, so it's somewhat in between. Um, regular, like the stuff of my, the kind of microcode that I've been talking about is something that's like very, very closely designed into the hardware to begin with. And it's developed in parallel with the hardware and it's mostly in ROM. There's a patching mechanism and so on, but you only get a couple of those. It's not something you can do um, all the time. So, um, cause you only get a couple of hooks basically. Like you have some RAM that you can put stuff, but there's a limited number of these hooks you can install. Um, it's just, just a limited number of slots. So that's a fair amount more hardware than like just some firmware blob that happens to be running on a custom DSP that then does the video encoding. 
So yeah, it's a somewhat of a gray area. Um, I'm not super interested in that kind of distinction though to begin with. Um, from a hardware point of view, like whatever's running on those DSPs, whatever media blocks is just software. It just is software. Um, it's not, doesn't have the same, like it doesn't have like any elevated privileges or whatever. It's just like, no, it's just software. Uh, and the only thing that is unique about it is that you don't happen to get source code for it and like whatever. It's not a block that you were supposed to be writing software for. Uh, so like from a customer point of view, it's microcode. From a hardware point of view, it's just, no. Like, if you think about it in terms of hardware, this is just purely software. So yeah. Exactly. So it behaves like microcode, but the implementation isn't really similar. Yeah, basically. Exactly. Yeah. 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 The microcode in a CPU is like plumbed into this very specific place in the hardware and has a very specific function for CPUs. Like all I've been talking about is just for CPUs. You can have similar ideas in other hardware or the other pieces of hardware where you might do this differently. But like this very specific thing of like, oh, I want to implement parts of my instruction set, uh, not fully in dedicated hardware, but using a comp, uh, some sequence of simpler operations, like whatever move to system register, something like that. Uh, that is really what like the kind of microcode I'm talking about is. And the stuff where you have like, oh, like you have some product that is sold as performing a given function and it happens to have hardware that is more general, but for it to have the advertised function, you need the right software is uh, somewhat different. I mean, you can argue the semantics of that, but, it's, it's, but yeah. Anyway, any other questions? All right, I'm not seeing any more questions. So I guess that's it. That's it. Um, thanks everybody for watching. See you around. And like, yeah, I'll upload this on YouTube as with the others. So you're not missing anything. And geez, this was like almost three hours now. So yeah. All right, thanks everybody. See you around.